So you made a bet with your friends as well, for instance. Looking at the title that we had up, Suicidal, Don't Push Me, you might be thinking, what's this about? Is this about bombing? Is this about terrorism? What kind of a title is this for a speech, for an Islamic speech? So you may have paid specs with your friends and said, OK, I bet you this is about, for instance, Palestine. Or I bet you this is about something else. So you're here just to see out the bet with your friends. Now, I'll explain why I've chosen this title during my speech. So all questions will be answered if you listen to what I'm saying. One tactic that we speakers use, and I've been told countless times by my teachers, both in Iran, Syria, and in England, is that one thing you have to do as a speaker is to inject a shock into your audience. Now, what does that mean? You've all seen, for instance, casualty. When someone's coming in, they're not breathing properly or they're dead almost. The doctors, they take this machine, the defibrillator, and they put it on this shock. To what? To wake them up. To bring them out of that state where they're asleep or dead. Now, the reason why I chose this title was to create that shock and to create that curiosity. But people think, what's this about? Is this about something political? Is this something, you know, to do with terrorism? So they might come and listen. Alhamdulillah, it's no, nothing of the kind, no, nothing political, nothing to do with terrorism. And I'll move on briefly so we get to the point. They say one sign of Imam Mahdi salam coming is reappearance is that near the end of time, men will dress like women and women will dress like men. How many times has it been that you've been, for instance, in a queue and there's someone in front of you and they've got long hair and you're thinking, okay, let's just wait for this lady to go. They turn around and you look at their face you're like, is that a lady or is that a man? Why is he grey like they've got a bit of a beard but their hair looks like, a... what's going on? You see, for instance, some men, they take away their eyebrows. They pluck their eyebrows to look good. Some men even, I was reading the statistics, some men spend more time in the morning than women do to put makeup on before they go to work. Foundation, I don't know, some bit of a blusher here. This is the kind of day and age we live in. So we can see that that sign has been fulfilled. Men dress like women, women dress like men. You see also women, women with short hair and so on. This is also another thing. Now, whether it's right or wrong, obviously we know it's wrong. But why do we do it? Why do people do it? Is it because their parents dress like this? I remember I had a student back when I used to teach Sunday school and he used to walk around with earrings. And I said to him, look, my friend, this isn't the kind of way that we dress. It's better that, for instance, at least when you're attending Sunday school to, to remove the earring. When his dad came after school to pick him up, I realized where he'd got it from. Because his, his dad had two earrings, not just one. So I realized that they pick it up from their parents. Sometimes you see a girl, she doesn't wear her job properly. When you see her mother, then you realize, okay, so that's where she gets it. So we follow our parents, we follow our friends, we follow people around us. We may pick a role model that is no good to us at all, yet we pick them and we follow them. So what does Allah say about hijab? Now, when I mention hijab, I know some of you boys automatically switch off. Hijab is for the ladies, leave it. We don't need this sleep for half an hour. No. Allah in the Quran addresses both the males and the females about hijab because it's deadly and just as important for males than it is for females. And the beauty of it is that in Surah Nur, from Ayah 1331, Allah speaks about it. He first says to tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to guard their private parts. Surely this is better for them. And Allah knows what you are doing. He's aware of what you do. The next ayah straight away addresses the women. As in Allah doesn't say, oh, hijab is just for women. Oppress yourselves. No. Because number one, it's not an oppression, which we'll come to see. And number two, he addresses both sides. And he says to the women the same. Tell them also to lower their gaze and cover their private parts, guard themselves. And then he goes on. And do not even ornament yourselves with necklaces, with bracelets, with chains, and so on and so forth, unless it's for 
this person, this person, for instance, like I'm in front of your father, it's okay. He's mahram to you. Your husband, your children, it's okay. So he gives the long list, and then he says, and don't strike your feet. How many girls do you see walking around with hijab? Yeah. Straight away, people look, what's that noise? And they look at, oh, oh, nice, their toes, tight hijab, what's, what's this? So it attracts attention. It does exactly what it's not meant to do. You wear the hijab, but then you make the sounds of your feet. And Allah Moses, he puts it in the Quran. He warns us. He tells them not to strike their feet. The best person to learn hijab from, from a lady's point of view, is Hazrat Fatimi Zahrasa. And there's a hadith where she says, the best woman, the best woman, is she who does not see another man and is not seen by a man. There's a hadith where once uh, a, an old man came to the Prophet's house, he was blind, everyone knew that he was blind, he couldn't see anything. Hold up two fingers, he'll say ten. Blind. Not just one of those partial seeing, no, fully blind. Yet he comes to the Prophet's house, the Prophet opens the door, as the Prophet Zahra goes and gets a hijab, fully covered, head to toe. After the Prophet asks her, Ya Zahra, my daughter, why, why did you go and get your hijab? We all know this man is blind. He can't see you. She said, Father, whether he can see me or not, I have a duty to fulfill. Could I see him? Of course. So I wore my hijab. They used to wear the um, bushi as well. So we see that she took such care of her hijab, even in front of a blind man. Now you might say, oh, Islam, Quran, that's all you talk about, you Muslim speakers. Give us something different. Alhamdulillah, for the last two and a half years, I've been doing a lot of comparative study in religion. So I quote a lot from the Bible, and I love to quote from Jesus, because I like to bridge that gap between the Muslims and the Christians. And so that we have something to talk about. When we meet a Christian, they talk about hijab, we can talk about hijab also. And the dangers from not fulfilling hijab. In the Bible, chapter Matthew, Matthew 5, from 27 through to 30, Jesus says, He says, You have been told not to commit adultery, but I say unto you, Whomsoever looketh at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. This is Jesus. This is the Christians it's preaching like this. What beautiful preaching. He goes on to say, If your right eye now, this is linking back to my title, controversy, this is why. If your right eye causes you to sin, gorge it out and throw it away. It is better that you go through life without an eye than you, for your whole body to be thrown into the hell fire. And then he goes on, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you go without a hand than for your whole body to be thrown into the hell fire. This is how bad it is. Do harm to yourself, don't commit suicide. Now you might say, okay, that still hasn't convinced us for the theme of the topic, I'll come on to it. The same way our mouth is a gateway to our stomach, our eyes are a gateway to our heart. Jesus says this. We've heard this from the prophets from the Ayam. But Jesus says this in the Bible again, Mark, uh, sorry, from Matthew 6.22, He says, your eyes are the lamp of your body. If your eyes are good, then your whole body will be filled with light. And if your eyes are bad, then your whole body will be filled with darkness. Now you might say, what a load of rubbish. What is this darkness, light? How can my body change colour? And it's a bow on a sunbed? Yeah, it's different. No, we're talking about the inside. To prove this further, anyone who's read Hayat al Volume 1 from Allah Majlisi will know that when Adam salam, committed Tarqa Allah, when he ate from the barley or something, the apple, some say the grapes, some say so on, when he ate that fruit that he shouldn't have gone near, he was sent to the earth and he saw that his body has become darkened. He began to weep and weep and weep. What state is this I'm in? What have I done? And he asked Allah to forgive him. He said, what shall I do that you forgive me? Now some say through the hadith that Jibra'il told him to do five things. 
Some say those five things were five prayers. So on. So ask, not the mission. Some say no. Some say those five things was to seek repentance in the five names. Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein. Some say no. Some say he was actually told to fast three days for that this darkness to be removed one third on each day until he would return to the light. Now, this is proof that when we look at something bad, it enters our heart. And when it's in our heart, there's hadith that say the devil is like a dog. He comes to you, he puts his nose on your heart, and he sniffs. The same way dogs go sniffing the floor, he sniffs your heart. He sees, what is this guy's weakness? What does he really like? What's in there, deep down there, that it's hiding, he never shows it, but I can bring it out to really put him into it. He sniffs this out, and then he causes you to look up. Because you've seen one during the day, you think, oh, okay. When you go home, then you think, she was nice. Or even opposite, for women. A lot of the time, the speakers always attack the men for looking at women. But we know that it's 50-50. A lot of women do look at men as well, which is it's natural. And that's why we're here to address it. The eyes are very important. That's why Allah says, love your gaze. Because he knows that as soon as you see something that you might like, that's to your flavor, that's it. It's entered your heart. Once it's entered your heart, it begins to play with you. Allah says, avoid that. To avoid a disease is better than to cure a disease. So he says, avoid it. Don't look at it. As soon as you see something, put your eyes down. Further proof that these eyes are what can control our body and is the, is the gateway to our heart is that when Ayyub he was a very devout worshipper of Allah and the, the Satan came to Allah and said Allah, you've given him everything what do you expect? you think after giving him all these bounties and lands and sheep and this and that and big family that he's going to turn around and do Nashor Kri to, to ignore you? of course he's praising you because he wants more from you and because you've given him so much give me control over Ayyub and I will show you that he is not a worshipper that he is not a true prophet that this is all faith so Allah said I will give you control over everything except his eyes and his heart that's what he said Take his wife, take his children, take his land, take his wealth, take his health. But his eyes and his heart are mine. Because Allah knows that this is our weak point. If the, if the devil infiltrates here and it gets into here, that's when we start getting into trouble. That's where it becomes serious. Now, hijab is not just a dress code. I'm not here to address, you know, wear your chador like this, wear your, you know, shoes like that. No, that's not my job. There are maraja out there, you can look in the film book and you can see. What does your maraja allow, what does he say about this and that? That's not my job here, to say how to dress. My job is to address our mannerisms, because there is two sides to the job. There is a dress code, and there is the way that you conduct yourself with other people. <coughs> the opposite says. So, how many times has it been that you've seen someone at uni, for instance, and you've gone up to them and you started talking to them, so, how was your weekend? And she replies, and then you say, oh, okay, so, how was your weekend again? And you find that the conversation is going in circles, but you're both standing there smiling and occasionally looking at each other. This is what we need to address. Or how many times has it been that you've gone up to a girl and you've been like, yes, the answer to that question is this, this and this. With your chest out, head a bit high, walking around, trying to be a bit macho. Or even sometimes you put your friends down to make you look bigger. Oh, look at him, how he fell over. <laughs> yeah? So she then thinks, oh, wow, he's such a handsome man. Yeah? And girls, now it's your turn. How many times have you approached a person that you like and in order to grab his attention, You've sweetened your voice, you've softened it, or you've smiled at him, or twinkled your eyes. We all, we've all seen it. If you don't believe me, I've 